We are now going to be having 12 shurim on 12 parakim. These are the 12 parakim of the story of the Tzitzah Shrayim, and I think it's very important before Pesach to get to know these 12 parakim. Now, there's stories and there's medrash, and there's teachings from the Gemara that has been gotten around. But to know the full story from need to end, what the Torah says, what we can learn from the actual tzukim, and what actually that actually happened, as the Torah says it, I think is very, very important, and that's the purpose of this chair. So let's dig in. Okay, we're going to start the shear, the story of Itzias Mitzrayim, but we have to have a little bit of a preamble first. The preamble is, let's start with uh, the beginning of Bracious. There was a creator, and the creator, which is Hashem, created the world. Now, Hashem then destroyed the world, and then there was Noach, who he saved. Noach and his family. Noach had three sons, Shem, Cham, and Yafes. Noach's grandson ultimately was then cursed, and he became a slave to his cousins, the sons of Shem and the sons of Yafes. Now, the son of Shem, ten generations later, Bechar ben Bechar ben Bechar ben Bechar, was Avram. Avram was the son of Terach. Terach knew that he was entitled to the lands of Canaan. Canaan settled lands along the Mediterranean Sea. These lands, rightfully, belonged to the sons of Shem, because Canaan was a slave to Shem. So therefore, Terach went and he left his lands to the northeast, and he went to go settle there. However, he only went as far as Haran. Avram continued the journey with his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot, and they entered into the land of Canaan. Now, Hashem promises Avram the lands, all that he walked about. And Hashem gives a promise to Avram through the name of Kel Shakai, and he says, these lands are going to be yours. Now, what happens is Avram then has a son, Yitzchak. And Hashem promises to Yitzchak and says, these lands through the name of Kel Shakai are going to be yours. Now, Yitzchak has a son, Yaakov. And Hashem appears to Yaakov also. And through the name Kel Shakai says, these lands are going to be yours. Because since Canaan the lands belong to Shem, and Avram was the oldest of the oldest. Therefore, his children should be the one to have the land. Hashem said in Bereshis, in Perak Tezvav, says that you have to have four generations, 400 years, and your children are going to live in a land that's not theirs, and they're going to be put to work, and they're going to have hardships, and then they're going to get this land. Now, Yaakov has 12 sons, and one of his sons, from his favorite wife, Rachel, is Yosef. Yosef is not born the eldest of all the sons, but he is born the eldest of his favorite wife. Now, Hashem did not appear to Yosef and give him the promise, as Kelshakai, that he'll get the lands of Canaan. However, Hashem did appear to Yosef through a dream. Two dreams, actually. And the dreams were as follows. One dream was that Yosef was a stalk of grain, and all his brothers were a stalk of grain. And then they all bowed down, the stalks bowed down to Yosef. So Yosef was equal to all his brothers, and they all lived in peace, and he was a ruler. But the brothers were jealous, so Yosef had a second dream. In the second dream, Yosef was a person, while his brothers were all stars. Egypt appeared as a sun, and Yaakov appeared as a moon, or the other nations, let's say, Canaan, appeared as a moon. And they all bowed down to Yosef. And that was the second type of way the dream was going to be fulfilled. That dream ultimately was fulfilled at the 400th year from the promise that Hashem gave to Avram. How's that? Avram lived in the land 75 years. Yitzhak lived in the land 180 years. And Yaakov lived in the land 109 years when Yosef went away. Yosef then, 12 years later, ultimately got out of prison and became king and then saw his saw that everyone was bound down to him. So that's when it was fulfilled. That was 400 years. Yosef is the fourth generation and Yosef was king. Now what Yaakov does is he actually gives a bracha to Yosef and he says, Hamalach HaGoel Mikolra. This promise that was given to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov is now being given directly to your children, Ephraim and Menashe, who I made Shvatim. 
So therefore, it was fulfilled now that Yosef's children would be king over Eretz Canaan. And this is where we begin, in Sefer Shemos. So, the, right now, in the beginning of Sefer Shemos, Bnei Yisrael are in Canaan. Sorry, in Goshen. They are in the choicest of the land of Goshen. As a matter of fact, Goshen, which is the northeast of Egypt, is flush and is fed by all the estuaries from the Nile River. So why is this? Because Yosef convinced Parai that they were shepherds and therefore they needed that land and they wanted to stay separate from the other Egyptians who were vegetarians and who worshipped different animals, or at least their gods had animal heads, and therefore raising that type of animal was an abomination to the Egyptians, so they stayed separate. It was a perfect plan. And as the parochium of Rashi's close, the Pasuk does say that they were Rishatu v'yerbu ma'od, that Bnei Yisrael multiplied and swarmed and grew great in Goshen. That's where we are in the beginning of Shemos. Everything's at peace. Everyone is fine. Bnei Yisrael living in Goshen. They are prospering. They are multiplying. They are getting rich. As a matter of fact, before Yosef died, he actually gave them in a Chuzas Oilam in Goshen. He actually gave them an actual possession in the land. Because what Yosef was able to do was he was able to get everyone from Canaan and Mitzrayim and the surrounding areas to sell them not only their money, but to give him themselves, their cattle, and their land in lieu of grain because the famine was so great. So ultimately, Pharaoh owned not only the money in the whole area, but he also owned all the land, the people, and the animals. Yosef then was able to give that land to his brothers and to his nephews and nieces as an achuza, as an actual possession. So Bnei Yisrael actually owned land in Goshen, and that's where they are in the beginning of Shemos. Now what's interesting is that when you look at Perak Tezvav in Bereshis, Hashem says that to Avram, the land of Canaan that I will give you goes from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River, which means Goshen, which is to the east of the Nile River, in between the Nile and the Euphrates, sandwiched between Egypt and Canaan, really would belong to Bnei Yisrael. So therefore, living and growing and multiplying in Goshen could actually have been part of the whole promise of Geula. And the entire slavery would not have been necessary. Now we're going to find out why the slavery was necessary, why they were enslaved, how they were enslaved, and if they actually were slaves. Let's see what the Pasuk says. The Eilish Shemais B'nei Yisrael Habam Mitzrayma Es Yaakov Ish Ubeisai Bo. These are the names of the sons of Israel that came to Mitzrayim. There was Yaakov. He was uh, Ish. He was an important person. And his entire household, Bo, they all came to Mitzrayim willingly. As a matter of fact, Yaakov asked Hashem if he should go down to Mitzrayim. And Hashem said, don't worry, I will be with you in Mitzrayim. So then the pastor goes further, Ruven Shimon, Levi Yehuda, the first firstborn. Then there's Yisachar Zavolin. Yisachar Zavolin all come from Leah, Uven Yamin, and the youngest of Rachel. Don Naftali got Usher, the sons of the concubines, of Billa and Silpa. They were co-wives to Rachel and Leah, and they ended up having four Shvatim, and that's the four Shvatim. Now, it says, Vayihi, and it was, Kol Nefesh, Yoytza Yerech Shivim Nefesh, all people of Yaakov's issue, of his Yerech, of his thigh, and of his loins, were 70 people, now, the Yosef Hayim Mitzrayim. Yosef was already in Mitzrayim, and we know the count of 70 includes Yosef and his two sons, Ephraim and Asha. They were already in Mitzrayim. They had come earlier to Mitzrayim. Okay, so basically we recapped exactly 70 people are now in Mitzrayim, but then, of course, they grew great. The Torah is now going to say, V'yamas Yosef, Yosef died V'chol Achav, and all the, his brothers, his, V'chol Darahu, and his entire generation, they all p- passed away. And 
now only the grandchildren and great-grandchildren were left in Mitzrayim. Okay? Nothing happened while Yosef and the Shvatim were alive. Ubnei Yisrael, and as we reiterate from what said in Bracious, Paru v'yishmutsu v'yirbu v'yatsmu o'yim o'yid. And they became fertile and prolific, and they swarmed, and they multiplied, and they increased. Great, great, great. But tamale aretz oysam, and they filled the land. What does it mean they filled the land? What, what is that What is that connotation? Hamalcha yosim yikol ra, yivarei chesa anigarim, v'kar v'hem shemit, v'shem avasai, avram yitzok, v'yavram yitzok, v'yidgu l'arayv, v'kar v'aretz. V'yidgu l'arayv, you're going to grow great, v'kar v'aretz. And you're going to be a myth to land. You're going to fill the land. So in other words, the and the Pesach after that says they will fill the land. Also, giving a little bit more uh, meaning to, to that promise. Which means that was fulfilled. Yaakov's promise that B'nai Yisrael will fill the land has been fulfilled. Now, right now the Torah ends. It has a pay. It has a little section mark, which means this, this section is over. So we recapped Bereshus. What's very important to remember is that at this point, B'nai Yisrael should have remained separate and probably should have started also moving back to Canaan. If they would have done that, if they had filled the land and they saw that they were now a little bit squashed in Goshen and they would have went to Canaan, and continue to multiply, and continue to go grow great, eventually they would have taken over Canaan without a sling or a sword or an arrow being picked up. They could have taken Eretz Canaan without any fight whatsoever. Because they would have just existed there, and they would have been the populace, and they would have taken over. And Yosef's children probably would have ultimately been kings. So, that's where we are after the first seven psukim of Bereshus. Then the story of the Yitzia begins. First the Yerida and then the Yitzia. But Yaakov Melech Chadash. Now, I want to just differentiate something. Melech Chadash. Whenever the Torah says Melech, when referring to Mitzrayim, it means the local nomarch. Mitzrayim was made up of several different districts. Now, Pharaoh was the ultimate ruler over the entire Mitzrayim. He was the godlike emperor. And then each district also had their own king. And we know this because Yosef was basically made an assistant to the king of Mitzrayim in Bereshus. And then Pharaoh became the ultimate Pharaoh while Yosef remained king. So Yosef had his Malchus while Pharaoh remained emperor. So therefore, when it says Melech Mitzrayim, or Melech in regards to Mitzrayim, every time it refers to the local chieftain, the local city-state king, and not Pharaoh. Pharaoh, Paro is Paro, and Melech is not. By Yaakov Melech Chadosh, a new king came al Mitzrayim, al Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is always referring to the district of Mitzrayim, sort of like New York City, and not Eretz Mitzrayim, or Bechol Eretz Mitzrayim, Bechol Gvul, which is the entire country of Mitzrayim, which encompasses all, which encompasses all the districts. So again, we have Bayaka Melech Chadash al Mitzrayim, the new king, the no, the local nomarch, got a, uh, got up on his district of Mitzrayim, and Asher Lo Yada Yosef. Now, Asher Lo Yada Yosef is referring to who? The Torah is always interesting when we're talking about pronouns because the Torah often leaves pronouns vague. When the Torah does not specifically tell you who the pronouns are, the pronouns could then be interpreted in multiple different ways. For instance, who is Asher Lo Yada Es Yosef that did not know Yosef? Is it the king of Mitzrayim did not know Yosef? Or is it the district of Mitzrayim, that not Yosef. Yoko Melech Chodosh al Mitzrayim, al Mitzrayim asher lo yada Yosef. On Mitzrayim, that did not know Yosef. And that's how I interpret it. Not that the king did not know Yosef, because the king probably knew of Yosef, but Mitzrayim did not know Yosef. How did Mitzrayim not know Yosef? We have to understand that the Torah doesn't say the word for forget over here. 
And says it says does not know, which means it's not like they forgot about Yosef or they never heard of Yosef. Um, or they heard of Yosef and they forgot, or they never heard of Yosef. It's they did not know. What does that mean? What to know someone? To know someone means to know his policies and to appreciate the person and have a car's tone for that person. So a new nomark got out of Now, if you remember, that job was really Yosef's. But then Yosef died, and the new nomarch, the new little city state king that got on top of uh, the district of Mitzrayim, he did not know Yosef. He did not follow any of Yosef's policies. He followed his own. He did not follow. Also, it can also mean he obviously was an Egyptian, not in Ivory. He was not from Yosef's family. He was not from Yaakov's family, unlike Yosef. He was a Mitzri. So this Mitzri got up over his district, and now things change. The district did not know Yosef. In other words, they forgot the promise that Yosef said, take my bones with you to Eretz Canaan. At this point, when a new king got up over them, when it's a secular king, when it's an Egyptian king, they should have said, you know what? Our time here is done. Now it's time for us to go back to Canaan. Let's take Yosef with us. Let's go to Canaan. We are a huge nation. We are prosperous. We are wealthy. We are many. Let's go now to Canaan. See ya. Goodbye. However, they stayed. And that is what led to the Gula. They stayed. They assimilated. They sunk. It's a lesson for all time. And he said to his people, now remember, over here it says Amai, his people, most of the time when it refers to Parai, it refers to Avadov. Why is it refers to Parai's Avadov? Because Parai owned the people. Remember, Parai, the emperorship, bought all the people as slaves during the years of the famine so they could have food. However, a Melech Mitzrayim does not own the people. A Melech Mitzrayim is only the local city-state king. But Yoimer Alamo, he said to his people, Hine, behold, I'm B'nai Yisrael. There is a nation B'nai Yisrael. Rav Menu. They are much too numerous for us. They, they, they grew up. They grew up over us. So Hine, behold, what was his shock? He was shocked. It didn't happen overnight. But the truth is, it happened over a short period of time. And he said, look, they're still here. They grew, and now Yosef is gone, and they're still here. They're staying. As long as they stay in our land, we have trouble. So he had two options. He could have done like every monarch in Europe did for 500 years during the Middle Ages and expel all the Jews from their land, and put and he could have put them back in Canaan. That's not what he did. Instead, he said, let's deal with them differently. Let's be smart about this. We could use them. We could stop their growth. We could protect ourselves. And we could use them. So he wasn't like Haman, who wanted to kill all the Jews because he and get rid of them. No, he knew he could use them. I mean, nor did he want them to be expelled. He wanted to use them to be, they should be successful, but they should be successful to the benefit of a triumph, and they should assimilate and they should be no, no, pose no problem. Hoven is Chachmolo, let's deal very wisely with them. Pen Yerba, lest they grow, Vahayatikrena, and they'll happen upon Milchama. It'll happen. The nice safe, and they will add Gamhu, Al Sainehu, Nenu, on our enemies. Mitzrayim, right there, Goshen stood between the Eretz Canaan um, and Mitzrayim, and Eretz Goshen had the way Horus, which is the Derek Philistim that the Torah calls, that, that line from Goshen to Eretz Canaan all along the Mediterranean. And that is where the different Canaanite um, and also the Palishtim would attack and they would attack Egypt from. So if they would attack and Goshen sitting over there on the northeast border and they would decide, hey, let's also, not only are we growing and we're going to take over Mitzrayim by numbers, but let's also attack them and let's, let's get them. So that's what this, that's what their fear was. They're going to join their enemies. The Nilcham Banu, and they will warn us, the Olaminam Aretz, and they will go up from the land. So one second. What does it mean, Olaminam Aretz? Are they going up from the land? In other words, they're leaving the land, or they're staying in the land. What's his fear? His fear was that they would going to stay, or his fear was that they're going to leave. 
So really, Olam in Eretz doesn't mean leave to Eretz Canaan, like usually it means going up from Eretz, but trying to Eretz Canaan. Here it means Allah from Lower Egypt to Upper Egypt. You should just know Egypt is on a plane. It's not a, a flat plane. It's on a um, grade. Now, from the Mediterranean in the north, going inland, it rises. The Nile, which starts up high, flows north, downhill. It flows north, downhill, into the Mediterranean Sea. It comes from mid-Africa, and it goes north through the heart of Egypt, and it goes to the, Mediter- it goes to the Mediterranean Sea. So Goshen, that's in the northeast corner of Mitzrayim, is all the way in the lower plains, right along the Mediterranean. He was afraid that they were going to go up. Where's up Thebes? Thebes is the capital where the pharaoh sat. That's in central Egypt, a much higher plain. He was afraid they were going to come up the mountain from lower Egypt up to, to upper Egypt, and they were going to attack Parai. That's what he was afraid of. But Yassimu loved Saramisim. So what did he do? He put tax collectors on them. Laman asnoibusloisam in order to impress them with his taxes by even ore miskinois parai and they built storage cities to parai as peace of Israel says in order to appease himself and get parai along with the plan of taxing heavily his district he had the cities built from their money peace peace of Ramses for parai. So that's how this local king was able to, de- to sell it. Pharaoh, I'm going to tax the people, but it's going to be to your benefit because they're going to build a city, a storage city for you. A couple things. Right now it says, peace sign, yes, Ramses. Peace sign and Ramses, sometimes easily translated as P, Ramses. Now, Ramses is not the first time the Torah talks about Ramses. As a matter of fact, Yosef mentions, right, mentions Ramses by Yosef. In Perek Mem Zion, it also says Ramses. It says in Perek Mem Zion that Yosef sat, that Yosef settled his father and his brothers, and he gave them a possession, a possession in the land of Mishraim, the best of the land, in the land of Ramses. So, question if they were taxed here to build Pisim and Ramses, so then how did Yosef give them Ramses? Very simple answer. The Torah always talks about names of places at the time the Torah was given. For instance, Be'er Sheva is mentioned before Be'er Sheva is named Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva is named because of the treaty that Yitzchak had with, with the Pelishtim, right, with Avimelech, and they called it Be'er Sheva. However, Be'er Sheva is mentioned before that as Be'er Sheva. Why? Because it's, a Torah is just referring to the place. So when the Yidin were given, when the when the Bnei Yisrael were given the Torah in the Midbar, when they're about to go into Eretz Yisrael, at that time, they could understand what the Torah was talking about, Be'er Sheva. So even though Be'er Sheva wasn't named Be'er Sheva until later, the Torah calls it Be'er Sheva in the beginning, before, even before that. So no, that, okay, the location of Be'er Sheva. So what's Ramses? Ramses is not Ramses in the time of Yosef. Nor is it Ramses in the time of the other Jews here. It was Ramses 40 years later. 40 years later, a king called Ramses II ruled over Eretz Mitzrayim. Not, Ramses was not the pharaoh of the Exodus or the Gullus over here or the Geula. He was not the one who Moshe Rabbeinu talked to, nor was he any of these other pharaohs that oversaw the indentured servitude and the hardship that was given to B'nai Yisrael. He was a king that rose later. So the cities were built, Pisam vs. Ramses. They weren't named Pisam and Ramses then. They were renamed by King Ramses II 40 years after the Gullus, before B'nai Yisrael was about to go into Israel, when Moshe Rabbeinu wrote down the Torah for them and gave them the Torah. That's when it was called Ramses, so that when they went into Israel, they could look at the Torah and they could say, oh, I see. The cities of Pisum and Ramses are what we built. Now, it wasn't called Pisum and Ramses when they were taxed, but that's what it was eventually called. So the king had an idea. The first thing was, let's tax them. The Bnei Yisrael did not lift a shovel. They did not lift a spade. All it was shell out money. And that should have forced them to leave also. They should have realized, one second, we're being taxed like this? 
they should have left at that time and went to Canaan. But instead, again, they stayed. Taxes, okay, they paid their taxes. Anyway, that was the first step. But the more that they were oppressed or, or, or subjugated to these taxes, he taxed them based on population, and they still they still populated. We don't care. Even though you're taxing us based on a person, we are going to keep, keep having more and more people, and we'll pay more taxes. We'll even we'll, If you tax every child we have, we will keep having children. And they became to dread B'nai Yisrael. Now they realize B'nai Yisrael is going to outgrow us. They're going to become so populous. They're going to take over the entire Mitzrayim. And probably the entire Canaan going to be so powerful. And of course, if there's war that happens to come upon them, they will join their enemies. This is a big problem. So therefore, what did he decide? Vayavidu Mitzrayim as B'nai Yisrael Mufarach. Notice how it doesn't say Eretz Mitzrayim. It says Mitzrayim. The district of Mitzrayim enslaved. So he, by Vidu Mitzrayim, actually what it means is this this nomarch enslaved the district of Mitzrayim, who, as B'nai Yisrael, who were comprised of B'nai Yisrael, with hard labor. So now we put them to work. Now he said, no longer are taxes enough, but now you have to do civil service. Now there's mandatory draft civil service. Men, women, and children have to get into the draft military civil service. No longer can you hide. No longer could you hide behind just being shepherds. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to then come into the civil service. The Yamara was chayim, and they bitter the lies. But avoid the kosher with hard work. The chaymer levenim, and the things that and and the things that they made to perform to make mortar. And to make bricks, the Khalavoid Basada and every single type of field work, as Khalavoidasam, all their work, Asha of Dubahem Farah, they all were the taskmasters over them, and they all were hard labor. I want you to notice one thing. B'nai Yisrael never became slaves. I'll tell you the difference. Slaves are people who do not own property and must be fed by their master. However, we know from many psukim in the Torah that not only did Bnei Yisrael have their own animals, because Don Moshe Rabbeinu asks that Bnei Yisrael take their own animals outside of Mitzrayim, but also they talked about how they grew garlic and how they grew scallions and uh, uh, scallions and leeks and how they um, uh, um, cucumbers and, and and gourds and how they uh, had fish to eat. Bnei Yisrael had their own land. They had their own food, they had their own animals, they had their own possessions. They were forced into a civil service of hard labor, and they were treated very badly, but they were indentured slaves, indentured servants, who could not leave, but they were not slaves, because they owned their own houses, they owned their own land, they owned their own possessions, but they were just put to, to work. So it's a nuanced difference, but that is a difference in, in, in technically what B'nai Yisrael was and wasn't in Mitzrayim. So this was not enough for them. So then the king of Mitzrayim, this local nomarch, said to the midwives for the uh, Hebrews, now, were they Milyaldos Ivriyais? Were they Hebrew midwives? Or they were midwives for the Hebrews? It's unclear. And the reason why I like the fact that it's unclear is because the Torah, while it is B'nai Yisrael centric, you have to understand when B'nai Yisrael left Mitzrayim, Eretz Mitzrayim, and they went out, they took with them the Erevrav, a multitude of other people who were in Mitzrayim from different nations. Most likely they all were slaves and their servants, uh, forced laborers, captives. And when they were able to go free, they took these people with them who fled for freedom as well. They fled to B'nai Yisrael. So in a way, it's a little bit comforting to think that A, B'nai Yisrael looked after itself, of course, but B, there are righteous among the Gentiles. There are people out there in the world who are not anti-Semitic. And there are people who risk their lives to hide people during the Holocaust and during the Crusades and during the Inquisitions and all the troubles that B'nai Israel had. This is a precedent for the righteous Gentile, 
for in a way whenever going through the millennial of millennium of Gullus that Bnei Israel and the now Yidden Jews go through over all these centuries and millennium. So it's a precedent that there are righteous Gentiles out there. So if they were only the midwives to the Hebrews, that also, in a way, I think, is a beautiful lesson the Torah is giving us to show that there are people who empathize with an indentured servitude of the people, Asher and people who are an, an impression. It's not like the Jews are the only nice people in the entire world and the rest of the world just wants to destroy the Jews. There are those individuals who will stand up and they have stood up throughout generations uh, for B'nai Yisrael. Asher, shame Ha'achas Shifra, the name of one was Shifra, the shame Hashem is Pua. And the second was Pua. The Medjah says who they are, but Torah does not identify them, so I will not identify them. I will leave them as Shifra and Pua because I think that having other heroines in the Torah is important. I think it's very important for men and women and young women to, uh, when they read the Torah, to see that the entire beginning of this gula, gula started with women. It started with with uh, with um, Yocheved having Moshe, even though there was a decree against the male children. It's a, a tribute to Miriam, who followed his younger brother through the Nile, and then had the had the goal chutzpah to, and, and, and courage to go ask the daughter of Parai if. She should go get a Hebrew midwoman to to be a wet nurse for this child uh, once the child was identified as uh, male. We'll talk about that in the next share. Um, and you have these, you have these midwives, Shifra and Pua, presumably women, who went ahead and did not listen to the king. And they started saving B'nai Yisrael. And it's amazing how in almost every story of Kla Yisrael being saved, there is always a woman who's... Uh, at center center of it, I mean, you either have the woman here, Hanukkah story, you have Yehudis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not going to go further into it. So, the king of Mitzrayim said to the midwives, and the name was one was Shifra and one was Pua, by Yomer, and he said, when you birth the Hebrews, and this is why I think that it wasn't necessarily Hebrew midwives. They were midwives to the Hebrews because it says when you when you specifically birth Hebrew children, in other words, they could have been midwives for Egyptians also, but when they would birth Hebrew children, or Isem al Av Noyim, and when you see on the birthing stool, you see that it's going over there on that birthing stool, Im Bain, if it is a son who, right, that it's Bain who, Bahamiten Oisai, make sure that it dies. Don't give it any life support, don't give it any clap on the back, let it just perish, let it just die. It doesn't say kill it. Notice how it doesn't say the word kill the children, it says let them die, don't give them any sort of support or aid, just like cast them aside, let them just die. The imbas, but if it's a daughter, he v'chaya, then it should live and you should give it you should give it life support and you should give it uh, to feed and you should wrap it and clean it and, 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 and make sure that it breathes. That you should do. But if it's going to be a son, now interesting, the Torah doesn't say here if it's a male child or a female child. It says if it's a son or if it's a daughter. He's specifically tying the gender of the child to the parents. It's a Ben. It's a Ben Ivri. It's another Ivri son. That's no good. An Ivri daughter, fine, but an Ivri Ben is no good. That was his instructions. But Tirana and the the midwives feared God. It's now God. It says God. It doesn't say Hashem. Uh, it says God. So who do they fear? Now Elikim could be a judge or could be a noble, but most likely it is referring to a God. And we're not necessarily sure it means Hashem. They feared God. They feared the Egyptian gods. They feared whatever gods they may have come from. They may have been foreign born and they may be, let's say, uh, from other lands and they had their other gods. They were God fearing people. And the common nominator of God fearing people is there's a morality, there is a 
there is a consequence to action. If there is a God, then there's consequence because people, if they just exist haphazardly on the world, then there's no consequence. But if they don't, if there's a God that put them on the world, then they don't live haphazardly uh, on the world. They don't live just by coincidence. They, there's a purpose. And there's a purpose, there's consequence. So they feared God, and therefore they had, there was a consequence. Veloy also, they didn't do that. They didn't always in cast aside the sons of the Ivrim, Kasher Diber Alehem Melech Mitzrayim, like was told to them from the king of Mitzrayim, Batechiena Asiyeladim. And they also gave life support to the sons, to the Yulad, to the, the children, the male children. Now they, now they called them male children because to them, they were children. It didn't make a difference if they were Ivory. It didn't make a difference if they were Egyptian. They are midwives. They have a calling. They feared God. And therefore, they gave life support to children, to male children. All the male children, they made sure that if it was a male that was born, they also cleaned it and, made, and let it to breathe and gave it and gave it to a wet nurse, etc., etc., etc. By Yikra, Melech Mitzrayim, Laodos. So then the Melech Mitzrayim called to these midwives, Vayemer Lehen, and said to them, Madua Sisa Natavra said, What are you doing? Why are you letting, giving life support to the male children? You're giving life support to the male children? What are you doing? But Tamarna Hamyaldais El Pari. The, 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 they, they fear for their lives. Now, now the midwives feared for their lives. So, they complained, they went straight above the Melech Mitzrayim's head and they went to Paray. They said, Paray, look what this guy is doing. He's trying to make a decree that all every children should die. Okay? This is ridiculous. We can't. We are midwives. We are mid midwives of Pharaoh. We are midwives of the, of the uh, we are assigned to the Ivrim, but we are important midwives and we cannot go against our oath. Right? We have to Give life support to children. So they complain now to Pare. Kiloi Kanashim Mitriam Ivrios. And they said to Pare, it's not that we're doing anything wrong over here. It's because it's when the it's they're not like Egyptian women, these Hebrew women. They're not like Egyptian women. Ki Hoyoisena. They're very vigorous. They're very, they're very, you know, they have very short labor. Their labor is bum bum bum, very quick. Beterem tovay aleihem. Before we can even go to them, before they they start labor, we we get called to go to them. Before we can even get to them, their labor is quick. Hamiyaldas we all do. They give birth and that's it. Now they have children. Now we were told. Remember. So why is it an answer? Because they weren't told to kill the male children. If it was Melech Mitzrayim, they told him to kill the children. Then he would have said, "What are you doing? Okay, I don't care if you get here late. Kill the child. Okay." You got there. You got there a half hour late. The child's already born. The child's already suckling with his mother. Who cares? Grab it and kill it. But that wasn't what the instruction was. The instruction was: do not give a light support. Let it die. Be passive. So therefore, they were saying it's too late because by the time we get to the to the every women who have short, short labor and they pop out the children, they're, the children are ready, uh, clean to the breathing, and they're and they're ready with the, with the winners. So therefore, what are we gonna do? They complained to Pari. Pari said, you know what? You're right. You're right. There's nothing you can do. King of Mitzrayim, be quiet. Bop you on the head. Be quiet. Okay. Deal with deal with your district in your own way. Right now, it's not my problem. I know you convince me that they might come up and attack me. Allah, right, they'll go up. They'll attack me here in, in Upper Egypt. Eh, this is not my problem. I'm, I, I don't know what you're talking about trying to, trying to kill male babies. And therefore, Hashem dealt very kindly to the midwives. And he multiplied them and he increased them greatly. Okay, this is a very, uh, I'm not really sure exactly, I would go into it necessarily how they were rewarded, but definitely they were rewarded. Um, either they became very wealthy, they, they had lots of children of themselves, or they were zeicha to birth a lot of children. They got some reward. Because the midwives feared God, the Yaslahem Batim, therefore they had uh, their their Batim. Batim could mean houses, Batim could mean their temples, right? Because we talk about Harabayas, talk about the bias that was built for Hashem, Batim could be their temples, could be the place of worship. The Yaslam Batim, they made 
these these worship, and they had other midwives join them with the fear and fear of God spread through these midwives. By its now, this is a big key pasuk in the end of Perik Aleph. By itzav paroi lechol amoy lemor. Eventually, the king of Mitzrayim convinced Paroi this is a national problem. This is not only a district problem, this is a national problem. Okay, you benefited from little taxes, you got your cities, fine. I'm working them, they're working, they're getting hard labor, but it's, but again, we could really benefit the entire Egypt. But it's not about the labor. Because if it was about the labor, they wouldn't go after male children. They'll go after the female children. Remember, males cannot procreate without females. So why go after the males and not the females? Because the females can marry Egyptians and they can have Egyptian children. You go after the males because you don't care also about the labor. It's not about the labor. It's not the labor you would keep the stronger gender alive, but you didn't. He wanted to go after the males. And then he convinced Parai this is a Egyptian problem. This is a call Egyptian problem. This is a call Mitzrayim, a global problem for the entire Eretzrayim. It's a national problem. The Yitzav Parai. So Parai issued a decree, Lechal Amai, to his entire nation, Lamar. It doesn't say Avadav because he's talking to his entire nation. It means all the people that were there, all the people that were visiting, that were residents, that were citizens. Uh, if you lived in, in Mitzrayim, this was the new law. Call Habain Hayiloidais Hayara Tashlachu. Every son that is born, you are going to throw it into the Nile, whether it's born that just now or whether you found that it was born and it's already an older child and it's already three months old or 10 months old, whatever it is, you find a baby that is born, it goes into the Nile. This is an active killing. And every daughter you could sustain life. Not just the midwives. He now tasked every single citizen, every single resident, every single person who lives in Mitzrayim. If there is a baby that is born, whether it be Hebrew, whether it be Egyptian even, it goes into the Nile. Pare said all male babies should die actively. Egyptian, Hebrew, it made no difference. Every male child now has to die because if it wasn't the entire Egypt, then there was ways of hiding Jewish male Hebrew children among the Egyptians. Pari did not want that. No hiding male children, no smuggling them, no dressing them up as Egyptian, uh, none of that stuff. If there's a male child, it's going into the Nile. No more this excuse. I couldn't get there on time. Every male child born in the entire Eretz Mitzrayim was thrown into the Nile. And that is how, and we'll discuss this more in the next chapter, Yocheve uh, thought it would be a good idea to put Moshe Rabbeinu, her son, well, he wasn't named Moshe Rabbeinu at the time, but her son into the Nile River to save. Why would she put it into the Nile? Obviously, everyone would know it would be in Hebrew. And Bas Pari did not know it was a Hebrew child until she opened the basket, and we'll talk about that. Because since the decree was against every single male child in the entire Israel, I'm sure Egyptians also had this idea of putting their children onto the Nile. Throw onto the Nile. Technically, I followed the decree. I threw on the Nile, and I put it into a basket. So it could be you know, thousands of babies floating in, in, the, in, a, in baskets. On the Nile. We don't know. It could be. Anyway, this is how Peric Aleph ends.